All right, so by a show of hands, how many of you guys in here own a television? Probably most of you. If you don't own a television, how many of you guys have watched TV at some point this week? You've probably watched TV at least some point this week. That's the majority of you out here have owned a television, or you own television, or you watch TV at least at some point during the week. Whenever I moved down to my parents' house about seven, eight months ago, whenever it was, I had to figure a few things out. And some of the things I had to figure out was like how the stuff works. I realized how much I made it, or how much I had life made whenever I was younger. See, whenever I was younger, when I was somebody year old's age, um, we go home, food magically appears on our plates. Um, the TV somehow randomly gets a funny picture in it. Um, our clothes appear in there, and our parents' money disappears in their bank accounts. Now, whenever I moved out, I realized these things aren't free. They all cost something. Sometimes they cost money, sometimes they cost time. But almost everything we have costs something. But let's go back to the television. So after I moved out, I realized that, okay, we, we want to get TV, me and my roommate. My roommate being, his name's Matt, okay? And we decided that we wanted to get television. So what did I do? I opened up the paper, got online, looked at the first ad I saw, and I got that TV package, right? No, that's completely not what I did. I did research, I looked at packages, I did all these different things to make sure that I was getting the best possible deal I could get. I didn't want to pay too much, I wanted to make sure I got all my sports channels, I wanted to make sure I could watch the Cincinnati Reds play whenever they played. That's what I did to make sure that I got the best deal possible. That's what we do, that's what we do in life. We try to make sure we get the best bang for our buck with a lot of banks going. That's what we do. It's like whenever we shop online, we usually get online and we do the price, lowest to highest option. That way, because we can see whatever the best deal is, or we go to the sale section of the website. We want to try to see what the best deal is. But we have a problem as a society. We, as humans, as people, we have a problem. And that is that we aren't looking for the right things. We're, look, we're looking and trying to buy things that give us no eternal satisfaction. We All we want to care about is the girl high, or the boy high, or the drug high, or the technology high, or the car high, or the sex high, or whatever high it is. That's what we try to fill our life with. And we're so wrong in doing that. Because the only thing that we need in our life is the grace that Jesus shows us, the grace that God gives us. And that's what we're going to unpack today. We're going to talk about how we, as people, can receive and accept this grace that we're given. Because you know what? You know what's cool about it, though? Is our grace is given. It's not purchased. Grace is given. We don't have to purchase this. It's completely free. And to completely show that, we're going to read a passage out of Luke today. Um, whenever, you talk, whenever we talk and read about passages out of the Bible, this isn't one that we normally think of. It's not one of the first ones come to our mind. We usually think of Jonah and a big fish, Noah and the ark, Jesus, crucifixion. We don't think of all these, of some of these other stories. We think of those big ones. But we're going to read one of these today that you might not always think of. And it's in Luke chapter 7. So if you guys want to open up your Bibles, we're going to go to Luke chapter 7. It's on page 487 if you're using one of the few Bibles. 487. And the story is a really cool one. And we get a lot of good material out of it. But here's what's, what's, what's kind of unique about it. Um, this story goes along with one of Luke's themes as he's writing. One of Luke's themes talks about how much Jesus loves to be with the sinners. How much he loves to help people. How much he loves to be with people that aren't the best in society. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So if you guys hang with me for a little bit, we're going to read verses 36 all the way down through 50. All right, I'm going to read that, talk about it, and then we'll see where we go from there. Okay, so it says, starting in, chapter, in verse 36, it says, Jesus was invited to the house by the Pharisees for dinner, and he reclined at the table. So just chilling. Jesus goes in the house, chilling at the table. No, nothing bad going on. But then a woman who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisees' house. <clears throat> So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Let's pause right there. 
what in the world is an alabaster jar? Well, if you didn't know, they're really like expensive. They're really nice. An alabaster jar back then would be like your mother's favorite piece of china that she has all her whatever your all's mom's but her jars. But that's what she had. And so she takes this alabaster jar, and this is what she does. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, Jesus, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. This woman has taken her jar, her most precious thing she probably has, and pours this perfume on his feet. Whenever the Bible says that someone is sinful, it's usually talking about something specific. I don't know the exact sins that this lady committed, but it's most likely that she was some type of prostitute or something, because that's usually the sinful nature whenever it discusses women in the Bible, which is not always the most happy thing to hear about, but it's usually the truth. Down to verse 39. When the Pharisees who invited him in this saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him, and he would know what kind of woman she is, and that is that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. He goes, tell me, teacher. This is where it gets cool. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay the man back. So what he did is he forgave both of them. He forgave both of these guys of their debts. And this is the question Jesus asked. He goes on, he says, now, which one of them will love him more. Simon replied, I suppose the one that had the bigger debt forgiven. And then Jesus says, you have judged correctly. You have judged correctly. Then he turns to the woman and says, Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but, when she, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet out of that precious jar she had. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, Who is this that can even forgive sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I know there's a lot of content there, and there's literally a thousand different directions we can go, but this is what we're going to do. Um, here we have something that's really not that unusual for Jesus. He's hanging out with the people that no one likes. He's hanging out with the Pharisees and the sinful people. Excuse me. And that's what he does. Jesus is like that one guy at school that y'all know that tries to go make friends of everybody. Um, he's that one weird dude that just wants to be and that wants to make friends of all the people that no one else likes. That's who Jesus was. And then this woman comes in who has been identified as a sinner. And what does she do? She begins to wash Jesus' feet. How many times do we hear that in the Bible? Think for a second. How many times do we hear about people washing other people's feet in the Bible? A lot. We hear it a lot because people do that. Why? If you didn't know, back then in the Near Eastern times, um, a few thousand years ago, washing people's feet was super important. You know why? Because they didn't, they didn't wear high Jordans. They didn't wear their J's with their big ankle socks. They didn't have um, these nice, nice shoes to protect their feet. They wore sandals. And a lot of them probably went barefoot, especially the poor people, where they made them out of whatever material they could find. And therefore their feet got absolutely disgusting. I remember there wasn't concrete roads back to them. There was dirt and dust and poop and stuff on the ground that we don't want to think about. Getting up in between their toes and their toe jam is disgusting. Literally, when I cut my toenails, I almost want to throw up. I can't imagine walking around barefoot for my entire life or an example. It would be even more disgusting. But the person that would wash these people's feet was usually the lowest person in the household because it was one of the worst jobs you could have. The person that was washing the people's feet at the door was usually one of the lower jobs because no one wanted to do it. But it was something you had to do. That way the house didn't get disgusting. I just thought this was kind of cool. Um, I made this little side note whenever I was reading through this passage is how many times in the Bible do we see people coming up to Jesus and be like, hey, hey, or hey, you're the same. 
How many times do we hear that? A lot. Let's think about it. It's cool. It's weird to think about. Imagine today. Who's the most powerful person in the United States? Right now, the president, Donald Trump. Who does he have around him all the time? His Secret Service agents. If you want to go talk to Donald Trump, you just can't run up to him and start washing his feet. You're going to get shot or tackled or something. It's not going to be cool. Imagine if Jesus' posse treated him like the Secret Service treated Donald Trump or any other high person. No one would have ever got to him. I just thought that was interesting. Because Jesus wanted people to find him. He didn't want to be secluded. Back then, people understood who Jesus was, and people were eager to get to know him. And sometimes they just wanted to be healed, and they wanted help. Jesus was able to heal these people, not only physically, but spiritually. And that leads us to our first point on how we, as humans, accept this grace. And that first point is that we need to seek Jesus on a daily basis. That's how we accept grace. You all can write that down in your notes if you want to. We can seek Jesus daily. Who has ever been to a zoo? Show of hands. Anyone been to a zoo or one of those weird safari things I have at Disney World? It's not really a safari because they're not really out in the wilderness. Or has anyone ever been to a real safari? I got in Africa. And no, oh, we got maybe one back in the room. But that's what we, that, okay, we've been there. We know what happens. There's animals. They're roaming around. So think about this. Imagine you're in the lion's den area. What do you see? You see the big tigers and the lions and all that stuff. But then let's think of the cubs. Think of the cute little cubs that you have stuffed animals of at home. Um, what are they doing whenever they're in the den? Who are they with? They're with their mom. Why are they with their mom? Here are some pictures of some cute little cubs with their mother. Let's go beyond that. Think of some ducks. What do we see whenever we think of little baby duckies? They're following their mother. What about when we think of humans as kids? They want to be with their mom. Why do they want to be with their mom? It's because they know that their mothers will keep them safe. They know that their moms will feed them. They know that they will protect them, give them shelter. Let's go back to our passage now. If you look at verse 37, it says that this woman was not invited. She did not get an RSVP card. She just came in. She found out that Jesus was in the town. She found out that he was at the Pharisee's house, and she went and found him. And then she washed his feet. Skip down to verses 48 and 50. This is what Jesus said to her because she did this. He said, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This woman did not do a single thing. If you read that section, well, she did do things, sorry, but she didn't say anything. She's not sitting there having a dialogue with Jesus. She's not doing that. All she's doing is washing his feet. She seeked him, and she got forgiven. Her sins were completely out. But not only should we seek Jesus like this woman did, but we should do it daily. So how in the world do we seek Jesus daily? Zephaniah 2.3 says, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility, and perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. How do we seek Jesus? He's not here right now. He's not down at Starbucks having some coffee. We just can't go find him like that. So how do we seek him? Christianity today says that less than 20% of people inside the church read the Bible. That's what blows my mind. Less than 20% of the people that go to church regularly read their Bible. A way you can seek Jesus is by reading your Bible. We know in 2 Thessalonians that all scripture is God-breathed. If you're reading your Bible, it's impossible to not find Jesus if you're doing it the way you're supposed to do you seek him, you will find him. Because he's already found you, and he's just waiting for you to find him. That's one way that we are able to seek him. We hear about grace and stuff in songs all the time, such as How He Loves Us by David Crowder. Um, it talks about how if grace was an ocean, we would all be sinking. When you seek Jesus, it doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are. Because if you seek him and you find him, you're going to drown in that grace every single day. So 
I challenge you guys seek Jesus through your prayer life, through your Bible. Do that. Our second point is that you need to give grace. What does it mean to give grace? Mike, you're not making any sense. You just said we want to know how to get grace. Why are we the ones giving grace? But that's okay. So I personally believe in order to get grace, we need to give grace. Um, some of y'all might not know this, but last weekend we had this thing here in Laurel County called the World Chicken Festival. If you guys don't know what that is, um, it's Laurel County was the place where both KFC and Lee's Famous Recipe was founded. I didn't actually know the part about Lee's Famous Recipe until this past year, but it's really cool. <coughs> Excuse me. But we have this festival called the World Chicken Festival where there's all these vendors and these booths and these freaky looking carnies with all the sketchy rides, and it's a really, really good time, and everyone in Laurel County either loves or hates it. But we as a youth group did this really cool thing where we were able to sell ice cream cones, and they were ginormous, and we only sold them for a dollar, so we did really, really good business. We, were, we actually were able to make for $5,000 in just three days. We did really, really, really good. But the money's not the thing that sticks out to me about the chicken festival. The cool thing was, is watching the people's reaction whenever we ate an ice cream cone. Whenever a kid would come up to the booth and we would hand them an ice cream cone, what did they do? And they, they lit up. It's awesome. They would grin ear to ear. And if they were a baby, they would kick the ice cream cone and they would shout their face. Because that's what they did. Because they, no one, everybody loves ice cream. And the kids loved it. But that's not the cool thing I noticed, even though it was so cute. And I wish I had a GoPro on my head the entire festival because there were so many cool things I got to see. But the cool thing was, is whenever we got to see an adult come up to the booth. And we made them the big tall ice cream. And this big bad adult that walked up to the booth, we give him this ice cream cone, and the same thing happened. They lit up, they smiled ear to ear. We were able to put so much joy into people's lives just by giving them ice cream cones. And at a really good deal. But everything at the festival was overpriced. You know, when people come and they're only able to give a dollar, and we're able to give them this giant thing, it might seem silly, but we were able to bring so much joy into so many people's lives that weekend. And that's literally one of the coolest things about the Chicken Festival this past year. You see, when we give grace to other people, we love them, and we give them a smile. That's a way we can give grace, is being nice to others and loving them, giving them a smile, giving them ice cream cones, was a way that we, as a church, were able to show people grace. If you jump back over to our passage, after this woman seek Jesus, what did she do? After she seeked him, she found him. What did she do? She washed her, she washed her feet for his feet. She used her precious alabaster jar full of her perfume and washed his feet. She performed one of the worst jobs, like we talked about, that somebody can have just to be nice. She was loving on Jesus. She gave up everything she had of her time, her perfume, just so she could be close to Jesus. Now, obviously, today here in America, we don't go and wash people's feet. Even though it would be kind of funny. If we were literally rich enough to have someone pay to wash people's feet whenever they got here to work, that'd be kind of goats. But we don't do that today. So, how can we do that? How can we wash other people's feet without actually washing their feet? How you do that is by doing things that make people smile. You see, whenever Jesus was in the Pharisees' house, they weren't worried about Jesus. They just wanted to make him happy. The Pharisees were focused on entertaining Jesus, while the woman focused on serving Jesus. You know how happy probably made them to see Jesus is laying back at the table and chilling? It's like he's in the game. Probably made them really happy. But they didn't care. They just wanted to know the fact that, they were, that he was there. They didn't care about Jesus. Is having dinner. But this woman was serving him. She was showing love to him. That's what we as people need to do. We don't need to try to entertain God all the time with our antics and our things because he doesn't need our entertainment. He just wants us to seek him and to find him. He wants us to help and serve others. That's what it's all about, is being nice to other people, making them smile. 
serving and helping? How do we wash other people's feet? That's doing something good for them. Helping the old lady at the store who can't carry their bags. Helping your parents mow their yard without asking for $50. Doing all these things. Volunteering at your church to do something. That's how we wash others' people's feet. I remember it was about a month or so ago, our secretary here at church, she lost her keys. Um, it was kind of bad because she was freaking out, walking all over the building, trying to find her keys. And she lives about 30 to 40 minutes away, and she's lost her car keys. So, like, what is she going to do? That's a big situation. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is she going to do? So our, we were searching all over the church, and then it was awesome. Our church secretary, his name's Jim. He actually went out to the dumpster, pulled out all the bags of garbage out of the dumpster, and started digging through the tracks to try to find our keys because maybe they got thrown away. That's how you wash somebody else's feet. Going out of your way, getting your hands dirty, to make somebody else happy, to make their day. Whenever we go to the store, what do we do? We buy things. Obviously, that's what stores are there for. That's the purpose of the store. And when we're at the store, what do we get excited about? We get excited when we see good deals. When we're at Kroger and we see the nice yellow things and we see the good deals, 10 for 10. Oh yeah. That's what we get excited about, is when we see these good deals. And when we get so many of our Kroger points, we're able to go to the gas station and we get gas for like 20% of what it should have been. We get excited about deals. We have a coupon box at home because I love deals because it's cheap and I don't have a lot of money. And fast food is really good. Not for you, but it's good. But we get excited about deals. But that's not the most exciting thing we get about when we see, or excuse me, when we're at the grocery store. We get excited when we see the freebie ladies. You know what I'm talking about. The woman, the women at the stores in their little white uniforms, and they're standing there in their cute little tongs, and they're handing out free food. That makes me so happy because that's a free daggum snack you're getting when you go to the store. I remember a while back ago we were at Costco and this woman was handing out free peaches and it was the best daggum peach I've ever eaten. That make your day. But why? Because it's free. We get it so excited when we see the magical words free. But the problem is we don't see grace as free. We feel like we have to buy it. Feel like we have to entertain Jesus to get it. We feel like we have to do this. He's already given it to us. It's just our job to go and accept it. How do we do that? We seek Jesus daily and then we give grace. Grace is not purchased. It was already purchased by Jesus when he died on the cross for us. That's not our job to pay for it. Because not a dollar in your bank account could go to one thing. Did not add up to that at all. It's not what our job to buy it. It's already been bought. And then when you realize that, your life can be so much more amazing. This is what Titus 2, 1 through 14 says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God, Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawfulness, unlawfulness, and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. We wait so anxiously pray it all the time. God, come. Fix this broken world. Let's fix it. God, come. It's what we pray. It's what we anxiously wait for. But what are we waiting for exactly? We're waiting for grace to finally be here. Because we want to experience it. Because it's been given to us for free. It's grace is given, guys. It's not purchased. You just have to seek Jesus' name. You need to give grace. You need to be nice to people. You need to love them like Jesus loved the sinner. Here in a moment, the band's going to come up, and we're going to do a song. And we're just going to sing. And we're going to beg for Jesus to come back and to fix this place. Because we need him here so badly.
testing. If you have questions or you have problems or anything that has something to do with grace, I want you to come up. I want you to talk to me about that. If you don't understand what it is, come. It's God's grace was given to us. You can't buy it. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're trying, because you'll never be able to afford it. Because it's already been given to us for free. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for us. God, we are so undeserving. Oh my goodness, it's crazy to think about that you would come out of heaven off of your throne and get on a cross and be tortured for us. When we sin and mess up almost every single day, but you did because you somehow love us. God, please help us to understand that you're giving us grace. God, we don't have to find it. God, please, just help us to seek you daily and to be nice to the people. And give you grace. Father God, we love you so much. We say this in your son's name forever. Now.